Uh, thank you so much. You know, this is, this is supposed to be the fun panel, the lighthearted panel. And, uh, and it will, will be some, but it's also, uh, <laughs> it's also going to be quite serious. Uh, there's a lot being talked about with cannabis right now. And it is, in terms of coverage of this industry, it's been, unfortunately, somewhat superficial, somewhat sensationalistic, and there have been loads of terrible, terrible pot puns that go along with that. And by the way, forgive me if I do have an accidental weed pun or can cannabis pun. I think it's some byproduct of covering this industry, but uh, it's not, not intentional. I, um, but you know, as I mentioned, this is an incredibly serious and a tremendously complex topic. And with this panel, we're going to delve deeper than the surface level because we have two of the sharpest minds on this topic here. We have Dr. Jonathan Hawkins, a distinguished professor who has been a drug policy expert for years and is a very prolific author and researcher. We have Ms. Lori Ajax, who has managed and navigated heavily re regulated industries throughout her career and now heads California's uh, Bureau of Cannabis Control, where she is tasked with steering one of the world's largest economies through this uncharted territory. I mean, because it's, it's tricky. It's tricky when states try to legalize something that is and remains a federally illicit substance. There are complexities that go along with that. There are conflicts. And we are seeing this come to a head now. And so where, where we're at, just to give a brief overview, so as of now, we have 10 US states that have legalized cannabis for uh, adult recreational use, uh, use. that's uh, 10 states in DC. And each of those states have different policies. More than half of the United States has legal some form of, legalized some form of cannabis for some medical purposes, and each one of those 30 plus states have different, different programs. Uh, hemp recently gained some uh, legal standing, some additional legal standing, but in terms of everyone's famous uh, favorite or now favorite can of cannabis byproduct, CBD, there are giant questions surrounding that. Uh, Canada legalized. This is, in North America, this is a burgeoning multi-billion dollar business, and it is growing, and it is chugging along incredibly fast, and it's attracting the attention and the investment of some of the world's largest companies. You have companies like Scott's miracle Grow getting into this. Constellation Brands. Yeah, Scott's is one of the biggest, I mean, more than one third of Scott's revenue now comes from uh, essentially the hyd hyd hydroponics business. And so you have, you have companies in agriculture, uh, tobacco, alcohol, pharmaceutical, consumer goods, natural products, all jumping into this market. But, but it's deeper than that. This is a public health and public safety issue. This is a criminal justice and a social equity issue. This is a medical and a research issue. You know, and this is a banking and regulatory issue. And apparently this is an Elon Musk issue as well. <laughs> and so it's, there are, there are many, many topics we can delve into with this. And how this will work is, John and Lori will get up and, and talk for a bit, and then I'll jump into a very brief moderated Q&A because, I mean, I get, I get to ask questions about this all the time. And I know, I know from my experience that people have a lot of questions about this subject, so I want to be able to kick it to, to you pretty quickly so we can get to answering some of your, your biggest questions about this. But uh, not to waste any more time, John? Well, thanks for that very kind introduction. And I am thrilled to be here today to talk about a topic that I have a passion for. I've been working on drug policy for 30 years, and I'm going to try to tell you a little bit about trends in supply and demand and maybe dispel a few myths. 
And the first myth I wanted to spell is that legalization is a single thing that you could intelligently say you favor or oppose. It's a broad category of policies, some perhaps good, some foolish. The most important distinction to make is are you talking about legalizing use, which is not a big deal, Alaska did it long ago, the Netherlands did it long ago, or are you talking about legalizing supply, a very different follow acts, and then within legalizing supply, who will be supplying? There are many options. Can be own grow, can be co-ops, can be nonprofits, can be government. I love to give talks about all of those, but today I'm going to focus on a for-profit commercial industrial model because that's what most of the U.S. states are doing, and that's what Canada has done, and that is the big roll of the dice. That's where there is real risk of a potential mistake that we could regret down the road. So think about it as a spectrum of policy options. At one far end is prohibition. We are leaping all the way to the other side, creating this for-profit industry. And that gets to the second big myth, which is that legalization means same old, same old, just without the arrests. That could not be farther from the truth. Everything about the structure, conduct, and performance of the industry is radically transformed when you move from a prohibited item produced by criminals to a legal item produced by the industry. And I'm going to try to walk through some of those consequences, the first of which is a radical reduction in production costs, which translates into sharp declines in price. So this graph just shows you the retail price in the state of Washington, one of the other states that was the first to legalize. Declines of 2 to 2.5% per month compounded to the point where it is the cheapest form of intoxication out there now. And that graph only goes through 2017 because that's when their seed to sale data system ran into trouble. We don't have more recent data at the retail, but here are wholesale price changes over the last year or so. They continue to be dramatic. So in states like Washington and Oregon, you're down to the $600 a pound range, maybe 10% what it was before the beginning of the policy liberalization. And it's very important to realize that the radical declines in price have been accompanied by radical increases in potency. As recently as 2000, the average THC potency of what was seized had just hit 5% for the first time. Now the average potency of the flour sold in Washington is 20%, and for concentrates, it is 65%. So the collapse in the cost per unit of THC and per hour of intoxication is much greater than the decline in prices, and we're not done yet. I've spent most of the last 10 years trying to understand how the industry would behave, what its production processes would be, what its cost structure would be under different regulatory regimes. We are only about two-thirds of the way from left to right across this graph. I can't go into details, but here is 10 years of my life in one arithmetic operation. A good round number for the retail price of cannabis uh, in the last decade or so is about $10 per gram. There is nothing that stops production costs from falling to $10 a pound, a factor of 453 different. Why do I say that? Because you can grow 1,000 pounds on an acre, and it costs $10,000 to grow an acre of tomatoes, and it's not really harder to grow cannabis than it is to grow tomatoes. At that point, the production cost, the wholesale price, will be a penny or two per joint, less than the cost of the sugar packets that show up on your table at a restaurant that are given away to you. Absolutely, there will still be expensive cannabis, just as there's expensive bottled water that doesn't really cost all that much to produce, but the bulk generic intoxicant can be astonishingly cheap to the point where most of the money will be made probably by bundling it with other goods and services. The convenience store will want to give it away as a lost leader so they can sell you gasoline. <laughs> the restaurants will want to comp you cannabis to stimulate your appetite the same way bars give you free salted nuts to get you to drink more. You could see these 
on the pillow of your hotel room the same way there are chocolates. There's nothing about the decline in production costs that cannot make this something that can be given away. And part of the industry's struggle when I go talk to both industry and investors in industry is how do you prevent that price collapse from destroying your profit margins 10 years down the road? And how do states prevent this from undercutting their taxes, which are mostly assessed on an ad valorem basis? So point number one, radical declines in production costs. Point number two, radical expansion in the product variety. It was not very long ago that marijuana meant something that you smoked, but that is so 20th century. There are dabs, there are vapes, there are solid edibles, there are liquid edibles, there are even suppositories. There's a crazy variety of products out there. I liken it to milk versus the dairy industry. 15 years ago, there was marijuana only, it was like milk. Now we have the equivalent of yogurt and cottage cheese and cheese and ice cream and all sorts of things out there that lower the barrier to entry for people who do not want to smoke something of any kind. And which provide variety that gives people opportunities to enter that they, if they would not have otherwise had. I can talk about that all day long, but I want to get to the next main myth, which is that policy does not affect the amount of use. And that's just wrong. All right? There's a simple plot, how many Americans self-report cannabis use in the last year. Left-hand bar, Carter administration, liberal policy of the 70s. Middle bar, after 12 years of Reagan-Bush conservatism. Bar on the right, the most recent household survey. Unambiguously, policy matters. But when you focus on number of users, you are missing the boat. The really important change is in the intensity of use. And let me tell you that story first with respect to how many days of use in the last month. The number of Americans reporting use in the last year has more than doubled over the last 25 years of liberalization, but not much more, and part of that's population growth. If you move to a more intense definition of past month use, there's been a tripling. But if you ask about days of use, because people are using more days per month, it's gone up by a factor of five. And if you ask how many people are reporting using it daily or near daily, that has increased tenfold, from 900,000 to 9 million. There's been a fundamental transformation in the place of this product in our social culture. It used to be a recreational product used on weekends like alcohol, it is now used daily like tobacco. And if I take the same numbers and put them on absolute axes, top line, alcohol, daily and near daily users, the line that is sweeping up and catching up is daily and near daily cannabis use. But even that's not really capturing the change because it's not just about days of use, it's about how much is used on a given day of use. So, 20 years ago, if people thought about cannabis use, they probably thought about someone who uses only on weekends, maybe a joint each weekend night that was perhaps 0.4 grams of material that was 4% THC. Do the math, that's four to five milligrams of THC per day on average. Today, 80% of the cannabis is consumed by daily and near daily users. They average one and a half grams per day, a material that is 20% THC. That's 300 milligrams per day, a 60-fold increase. Does that matter? We do not know. The human body has spectacular capacity to develop tolerance to certain neurotransmitters. It may not have behavioral consequences. But then again, it might. My main vice is Diet Coke. This is 78, 76 milligrams per day of caffeine. But if I thought about increasing that by a factor of 60, I'd be talking about having 30 grande cappuccinos at Starbucks every day. Would that have a behavioral or health effect for me? <laughs> and if you want to get worried compared to cocaine, there's such a thing as coca tea. It's been used for a thousand years in the Andes with no health consequences of any kind, that's four to five milligrams. Same as what I had on the previous slide. We've also done studies of American chronic cocaine users, a terrible term, the government forces us to use it. But think about heavy compulsive users in need of treatment. They have never averaged as much as 300 milligrams per day of cocaine. 
So does that big increase in use matter? We just don't know. When I have more time, I run through a bunch of laboratory studies where you have randomized controlled trials of people getting placebo, people getting THC. You look at impact on performance in driver simulators. You look at impact on self-reported intoxication or other outcomes, and you see differences. And the punchline for my talk when I show those slides is the studies were done with 20 milligrams of THC and 40 milligrams of THC. We've not done the studies of 300 milligrams of THC. Will it be a problem? I don't know, but I can't guarantee you that it won't be a problem. I want to close just with a few comments about the overall regulatory structure, having described some trends in supply and demand. The first point it was already alluded to is every single thing that is happening in this country is fully illegal under federal law. It's just the law is not being enforced. But it matters in a bunch of different ways. Canada truly legalized because they did it nationally. And for example, you see alcohol and tobacco companies making multi-billion dollar investments in Canadian cannabis companies that's not happening here. When we legalize nationally, there will be a transformation. And I say when, I think it is going to be when. I don't know exactly when, but a good friend of mine a few years back said, and I think this is a prescient comment, it would happen in the second Hillary administration. I think he's actually more accurate about predicting cannabis industry than he is about politics. Every single one, practically speaking, of the Democratic candidates endorses legalization. I think it could happen in the same block of four years, even if under a different president. But when that happens, it's going to matter enormously what is done relative to Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, something people don't talk about. Removing cannabis from the Controlled Substances Act still leaves every single thing the industry is doing completely illegal because unambiguously this is a drug and it's not okay to sell drugs that are not FDA approved in this country. And so how that tension is resolved, nobody knows. It will probably depend on which wing of the industry wins the lobbying war because there are companies that would want it to be treated more medically and others that do not. And that leaves the question, of, well, what happens to the medical space in general? There is such a thing as pharmaceutical-like applications of cannabinoids, but that's a tiny, tiny share of the sales. Most of it is recreational, and then the other big chunk is sort of a wellness thing. It's people using it like ginkgo balboa or snake oil or placebos that are terrifically effective for general unhappiness, but isn't really medical, and what's going to happen to that big chunk of the market? And I'll leave you with just one other thought, which is that there's also international treaties that we have signed that make all of this illegal. Canada is completely in non-compliance of those treaties. And we should remember it's only in places like the United States that there's a notion that cannabis is a soft drug and cocaine is hard. If you're in Latin America, you don't make that distinction. Because if you're worried about the traffickers' corruption or violence, you are just as dead if you get shot by a cannabis trafficker as if you get shot by a cocaine trafficker. And so once North American countries break the taboo of violating the treaties, this could well spread beyond cannabis. And as a final thought, at the end of the day, when we look back in 20 years on this experiment, not only do I think we might say, why did we think it was a good idea to put supply in the for-profit sector? I think we're also going to evaluate it on its impact on alcohol and tobacco use, which is completely unknown. The optimists say that cannabis will substitute for alcohol, but the honest truth is the literature is split right down the middle and we will know in 20 years. And the literature on tobacco is even more pessimistic, that in the past things that expanded cannabis supply increased tobacco smoking. Nothing that happens with cannabis could offset the harm of even a 5% increase in tobacco smoking, and there's no way that one can rule out that indirect effect. I know we were supposed to be optimistic in this panel after the fact. So I don't feel like that should be the last word. I will step aside as the irrelevant academic and turn this over to Lori, who really knows what's going on because she's in charge of all this in this state. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm going to try to follow that up and be very optimistic about where we are in California. Uh, good morning, and thank you for having me here today. So I will say, you still can't put cannabis on the pillow in your hotel room. That's not happening in California yet. Uh, 
So anyway, I'm going to give you, I, so we already talked about what states legalize. This just gives you a visual of where we're at. Obviously, the dark blue are the states that allow both adult use and medical use. And California is certainly one of those states. We weren't the first to uh, uh, come out with this. In fact, in 1996, under Prop 215, that is when California legalized medical cannabis. However, there was no state regulatory system. This was all regulated, if it was regulated, at the local level. And the reason I bring this map up is because everybody likes to ask, well, uh, compare us to Colorado and Washington and Oregon. Uh, it's very difficult to have a comparison because California is just so different. We had uh, decades of a legal medical market when we started to regulate this at the state level, which really made it, which was one of the primary challenges we have and still have uh, with this market. Plus, uh, Colorado's market is about the size of Los Angeles here in California, so it is, it is a huge market here. Uh, this is uh, uh, basically our timeline. Uh, it started out with Prop 215 in 96, and then you see uh, it pretty much went lightning fast. Um, we had the Medical Cannabis Regulation and Safety Act that was passed by the legislature and signed by the governor in uh, two, October of 2015, and that's what established uh, the Bureau. Um, and that is our first task was to just set up the state regulatory system for medicinal cannabis. That changed very quickly for us when Prop 64 was passed uh, later that uh, year in uh, 2016. And then we were then, our role expanded to also set up the regulatory system for both medical and adult use. At that time then we had two different we had the uh, Prop 64, then we had the Medical Cannabis and Regula Regulation and Safety Act. Uh, they combined those two pieces of legislation and put them together, and now we have one single regulatory system for both medicinal and adult use. Um, our task, when we got started, our bureau was established in February of 2016. Like I said, we had medical, we had adult use by the end of the year, and then we had one year since the passage of Prop 64 to set up that regulatory system and begin issuing licenses. We had a statutory mandate of issuing licenses on January 1st, 2018. Did we make that mandate? Yes. Yeah, it doesn't say yes. <laughs> Anyway, we did. We started issuing licenses, and then we came out with what was called emergency regulations. We did finalize our, our permanent regulations just this year. Uh, some of the highlights uh, that some of you may know, uh, unlike, and by the way, I come from the alcohol industry. I worked for the Alcoholic Beverage Control, regulating alcohol for over 22 years. So when I came into this, I, I foolishly thought, how hard could this be to regulate? I've been doing alcohol. This can't be that hard. Oh, my gosh. There, there is no comparison on the product. It is a very complex product, different to regulate. Uh, as Jonathan said, so many different forms. It's just not joints anymore. It's everything under the sun, which makes it very difficult to regulate. Um, but here's some of the other challenges. When it, when I just want everybody to know, when we set up our regulations and when we talk about regulations, that's all the rules that our licensees at the state, as cannabis licensees, have to follow. Uh, but one thing is, the local, there is local control here with our cannabis, reg, uh, cannabis system set up in California, which means that uh, the Bureau cannot issue a license if the local jurisdiction says no. Uh, they have complete control on whether they're going to allow commercial cannabis activity in their jurisdiction. Uh, at the state level, our job is to set up the baseline for the regulations, so we, our regulations is what all cannabis licensees have to follow. However, the local jurisdiction can be more restrictive. And of course, we place our highest priority with our regulation on public health and safety. Uh, so what do we regulate? Everything. Cultivation, manufacturing, processing, retail, distribution, you name it. We still don't allow drones to deliver your cannabis yet. I put that out there because I think that's just, um, we, we had to actually put in our regulations that you can't deliver cannabis by drones. But some people were very disappointed in the industry when we weren't going to allow that. But we're not allowing that. Um, we also don't regula regulate personal cultivation. That is done at the local level. So one of the challenging parts of this is that the Bureau isn't the only 
state authority that's issuing licenses. We share that authority with two other agencies. So the Department of Public Health, uh, they regulate the manufacturers. They're the folks doing all the tinctures and the concentrates and the edibles. The Department of Food and Ag regulates the cultivators, and then the Bureau regulates the rest of the licensee, which is the distributors, the retailers, the folks that are delivered, the non-storefront retailers that deliver, uh, the micro-businesses, and testing labs, and our special cannabis events. Because yes, you can have a temporary cannabis event anywhere in California to sell and consume uh, cannabis, you know, similar to alcohol events. Again, the locals, again, I, it's, it's very important to, it's, to stress the locals have control. How many cities and counties do you think have adopted ordinance and are allowing commercial cannabis activity in California? Anybody have a guess? What do you think? Half? No. Yeah, it's not, it's, it's a little over a third of the cities and counties. So how does that, how that impacts our licensing is we're only able to issue licenses in a little over a third. Uh, we still have a lot of jurisdictions that outright ban it. Uh, we still have some that are trying to decide what they're going to do. Uh, but right now, uh, as of uh, today, we're, we've issued just under 11,000 licenses across the state. Um, obviously, as more cities and counties pass ordinances, that is going, that number is going to continue to grow. Um, I went backwards, sorry. So, uh, I thought this might be interesting. So, right now we're issuing temporary licenses. In order to meet our statutory mandate, most of our licensees in the state are operating off of temporaries. They are expiring, so we're, we're working on getting them their annual license. Uh, and one of probably the biggest challenges we're having with this industry is, as Jonathan said, having this product be federally illegal with, uh, is very difficult to regulate. Uh, so many things that we take for granted at the federal level, especially when it comes to alcohol, the state has to take that all on themselves. So ev everything to deal with regulating this product, the state does it. Um, and, and one of the things we're finding is because people are still worried about because this is federally illegal, just trying to get any kind of information to complete their annual application is very difficult. As you can, these are, this is an industry that's not used to keeping records. They deal mainly in cash. Uh, when you tell them, we need your, you're a corporation, we need your business formation documents, they basically say, really? Well, how do I go about doing that? So it's, those things are very, we don't think about that. And when we then tell them in our regulations, you have to, keep all your records, all your invoices, anything that has to do with commercial cannabis activity, you have to keep those records for seven years. They're like, wait a sec, I've, I've been spending the last 20 years not keeping records because we don't want the federal government coming after us. So that's a real shift in mindset, and it goes back to what I was saying. Having a decades of having a medical market in place in California, transitioning to them to state laws and state regulation has been a challenge. Um, I'm going to go to this because I think it's very interesting for people to see what the, the supply chain looks like. This is a really ugly supply chain, by the way. If you're really trying to get your product to market, it's very difficult. It's unlike alcohol. Uh, so you're, you have a distributor in the middle, so every batch of cannabis has to go through some rigorous testing requirements. Every single batch of cannabis. So from, it can go from the cultivator to the manufacturer if it's going to be processed, or it can go directly the cultivation to distribution, but everything has to go through a distributor, and the distributor arranges for the testing lab to come out and pull the random sample to take it back to the lab to test for all sorts of things from the cannabinoid contents to microbials to contaminants to 66 pesticides, heavy metal, moisture content. It's quite extensive in what they have to do. Once, uh, if once that uh, lab issues what we call a certificate of analysis, they report that back to the distributor. The distributor ensures everything has passed testing, that all the labeling is correct, and before it can be passed on to the retail location. So uh, we have, how many labs do you think we have in California right now? What do you think? 
Somebody said three. No. <laughs> that was my we have a, We've got about 54 labs right now in California that are processing all of the cannabis batches for California. Uh, so as you can, you know, they're going through it, but some of these tests can take anywhere from five to two weeks. So there, and you can imagine if you're the distributor, you get a big batch of cannabis, you have to arrange for the testing. So it is, it is not a quick supply chain. Uh, the Bureau reviews every single certificate of analysis. We're about, uh, since uh, we started last year, we're at about 38,000 certificate of analysis. When we first started testing, we had about a 20% failure rate. Uh, we are now down to uh, just under 12%. So, uh, and a, a biggest, the biggest thing for failure is everybody's going to tell me it's pesticides. Everybody thought it would be pesticide. Probably our biggest failure rate has been on the cannabinoid content, the THC level. We had a lot of people that thought, a lot of cultivators were very disappointed when they had to go through testing, finding out a lot of their strains were less THC than what was reported prior. So that's, so that's a good thing, that that's, that's the biggest failure rate. Then it's pesticides, uh, then it's uh, residual solvents, and then very small amount is for heavy metals. So uh, just to let you know, if you're, if you're buying from the legal market, you can be assured that it's going through very strict testing. You don't see that in alcohol, by the way. There's nobody's, you know, the state's not testing a pallet of beer before it goes to retail. That's all done at the federal level. And even then, it's not done to, the, to what it's done here in California. So uh, that's probably, probably our next biggest challenge is how do we get the word out to the consumers? Because as Jonathan says, the price is dropping, but unfortunately, in, if, you're a, if you are a licensee, you have to pay your licensing fees, you have to pay your local taxes, your state taxes. You can't compete with the black market because they can sell cannabis a lot cheaper than the regulated market. Uh, so we are working on making sure uh, uh, a couple of campaigns to make sure to you make sure consumers or even you if you're planning on going to a retail why you want to go to that retail to a licensed retailer and you're going to get safe cannabis so enforcement is probably the biggest thing that right now is a priority for us as a bureau not only licensing people but enforcement because we have of, of the nearly 7,000 complaints we've received, uh, we're probably 80% of them is for unlicensed activity. Biggest thing, a lot of unlicensed people. So we are working, uh, we work, we, every time we get those complaints, we're calling the, the person saying, you can't do this without a license. We're trying to get them into compliance. We're sending cease and desist letter. If we can't get compliance, we then transfer that to the sworn arm of the bureau. We have sworn officers that go out and m make cases and serve search warrants. We're also inspecting the premises of the folks that we are licensing, because once you license someone, you gotta make sure they're following your rules. And then probably one of our biggest challenges this year is the advertisement. How many have just seen billboards all over just popping up for ease, delivered, marijuana delivered, everything? Um, so that is another thing we'll be tackling is making sure they're following all the advertising rules because there are some strict rules in statute and in our regulations. So that is a big priority for us. And lastly, I'm going to leave you with what's going on. I we just started our public campaign, so hopefully you're going to see us competing with those billboards, basically, hopefully, um, and making sure people are getting licensed and consumers start utilizing the licensed market. Um, we also uh, just announced, um, we have a new, in case anybody are wondering if you have any licensees in your area, the Bureau has a license search. You can go there, you can find out who's in your area. If you're looking for it or you just want to know what's around, you can search by city, county, zip code, and you can find out the licensees in your area. Um, and lastly, we just announced um, we are, uh, uh, Senator Bradford uh, had legislation last year, the California Cannabis Equity Act. Uh, the Bureau was uh, charged with uh, giving grants to local jurisdictions that have local equity programs to help those that were, uh, you know, affected by the war on drugs. So we are looking to 
different communities um, and helping them not only with, uh, with grant money, but with also technical assistance. That's out there uh, for local communities to apply through the end of the month. And I'm just going to leave you with this, because um, I, I want, I, you know, however you feel about uh, cannabis and whether it should have been legalized or not, um, there was a lot in Prop 64 that I don't think people realized. Um, the tax rate was in there. We get a lot of complaints about how high the taxes is. But wherever you at, are at on the issue, you know, one of the biggest things that was important to the Bureau is that we come in with strong regulations, making sure that if, we're, if this product is legalized, if the, the voters spoke, but making sure we are tracking this product, we are cracking through seed to sale this product, similar to Washington, our system's getting up and running, but making sure that consumers are safe and the public is safe. That is always going to be our highest priority. Um, Things are, I do think, um, I'm going to tell you, I won't, I would never say this is a fun, this is fun, it has, it ha the fun hasn't hit me yet, I'm waiting for that, uh, it's been three years of, uh, uh, of, of challenges, uh, but it is, it's, it's a fascinating product, and I think Jonathan would agree, uh, it's the biggest challenge, I think, I think California is doing it right, I think we are doing it the right way by protecting consumers. And, uh, but I, I think as we progress through the marketplace, I do think things will change. You know, the big alcohol wants to come into this industry. Right now, you can't mix alcohol and cannabis, but I do think you'll see some inch change, and I think it's an interesting thing to keep track of. Um, we were just talking before we got up here. I would have loved to have been back in Prohibition to see how, if they felt the same way we did about cannabis. Like, it just seems like it's still the Wild West, and it's like, was this how it was with alcohol. So I guess we will never know. But anyway, thank you so much. Thank you. And, and forgive me for one, one moment. The reporter left her notebook up here, and it feels <laughs> weird to be separated from it. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, let's, in terms of with this, this industry and what, what we've seen develop nationally and in California. And, and you, you address this, this somewhat, Lori, in terms of some of the, the licensing uh, aspects that are, that are occurring. I mean, just recently, there's been a lot of reports uh, where folks in the industry or outside of the industry are expressing concern about some of these log jams in licensing. And then it gets broader into the questions of the broader unregulated uh, illicit market as well as you try to loop those folks in the legal system. What kind of resources are you putting in to fix this? Yeah, so uh, if you want to complicate a licensing system, put three agency in charge of issuing licenses. So uh, that, that's probably another complication. At the Bureau, uh, we're, really, we're not seeing the log jams as much as you are at Department of Food and Agriculture with the cultivators. And a lot of that has to do with the tremendous amount of requirements for, you know, making sure they're, they're they, you know, they've, they're following the CEQA regulations, the, the Environmental Act, um, and getting their water permits and making sure with fish and wildlife and the water boards that they have all the permit. Because in California, there's some, uh, a lot of strict regulations when it comes to all that, that affects cultivation. And I think what you're finding, especially with your smaller cultivators, it's really a hard, hard, high bar to get to. And so just trying to get these things and make sure we give them enough guidance. So a lot of that is just them not used to having all of these rules to follow. So uh, we've, we're, we're, I mean, all of our resources are making sure that we can get, continue to get people licensed and we don't let anybody's temporary expires because as most of us know, if, if, they, if, we, if these people drop off, they're just going into the, the unlicensed market again. And so we gotta keep making sure we keep people in the regulated market. And, and that means making sure our priority is licensing, but also uh, taking really swift action against those that are not going to get licensed and continue to operate illegally. And, uh, and then, John, in terms of the, the research aspect, you, you, you touched on, on that. Uh, we've seen uh, some research develop in Israel and in other countries uh, on, on this, this issue and then in the U.S. because of the 
federally illegal nature of this. It's what is allowed for federal research doesn't, doesn't match what's being sold uh, in, in dispensaries uh, or on the retail market. Where do you see the biggest need for, for research in this area? Uh, and what can be done to address that, that conflict that, that's occurring at, uh, at Ole, Ole, Ole Miss and uh, the facility there? Yeah, so the federal government funds like $100 million a year of research in this space, but for the lab studies, the product itself is very low potency and unlike what's being used. So one of the big holes is to do research with material that looks like the stuff that people are using now. I think the second big hole is to look at concurrent and in, in co-use with alcohol and tobacco. That's something that we've neglected. And trying to understand how the liberalization of cannabis policy is going to affect alcohol use and tobacco use is another blind spot that I'd like to see addressed. Certainly. Lori, do you have thoughts on this issue? Yeah, well, I, uh, we're increasingly seeing like products that come through testing that are marketing to the alcohol consumer. So where even though you can't mix the two substances, we have uh, cannabis companies that are coming through saying it's cannabis beer or cannabis margarita or it's a cannabis mule. Uh, we, we did put in our regulations that you can't use any terms like beer, wine, liquor, or spirits on your labels, or you can't give the misimpression that it is an alcoholic beverage. But it's increasingly sort of, I'm seeing this desire, even though it's not an alcohol product, but to market it as an alcohol product. And so we're seeing a big increase in that and trying to keep on top of that. Certainly. And, and you spoke to, and both of you spoke to this, uh, the emergence of kind of what develops when you have a patchwork of state regu regulations amid uh, federal government that does not allow this and it's not actively in enforcing this. But how long can this steady state continue? I mean, all not long. It's not a steady state. Well, well, <laughs> when, in, in terms of hold on one, one second. Okay. In terms of um, how long can a state like like California or can a state like Colorado continue doing what it's doing when all these businesses, they can't openly bank, they're running cash-only operations, and you have new states legalizing either by, uh, well, by vo voter measures or by perhaps le legislative measures. If this keeps growing as it does, what does that federal state conflict look like? And what needs to change either in the immediate term or in the long term? I mean, is it banking first? Is it research first? Is it more broader enforcement? Uh, Lori and then John, I know you have a lot to say on this. But. Well, banking would, I think from my standpoint, banking would be a huge relief for us because whenever you're regulating any kind of product, when people are dealing mainly in cash, it's very difficult to, to perform audits and enforcement. And then the public safety issue alone of uh, the distributor is responsible. I didn't mention this for collecting the excise tax and the cultivation tax. So them driving around with hundreds of thousands of cash in their vehicles trying to get it to the correct state taxing agency. Those are all issues for us as California. So I think if my top priority would probably be some relief with banking um, because I think that affects all of us in some way. And John? Well, I'd agree, but that's like a five-year issue. Yes. Because in five years, I think the federal law is going to change. So I think we're in a weird transition period that creates all sorts of craziness. But that's not, I don't think, going to be the long run. Certainly. And then, uh, I guess, in the immediate term, looking at, you, you mentioned the, the Food, Food, Drug, and Cos Cosmetics Act. We're seeing that play out with C CBD right right now. And with CBD, like but not THC? Oh. It, it's strange, right? <laughs> There's definitely a lot of investment in C CBD, so I think that's probably one of the main reasons why you're seeing a lot of attention to it right now. But with that, do you think... How do you think the FDA could approach this this issue, or or will it take uh, will it take Congress before the FDA jumps in? 
Well, the FDA has moved into the CBD space because CBD, which is not intoxicating and dependence inducing, is no longer seen as a Controlled Substance Act issue. It's not like cocaine and heroin or THC anymore in FDA's eyes. So FDA is, is moving in that space. But with respect to THC, I think FDA says, eh, it's still illegal. It's not our job now. This will have to be worked out by Congress at the time of national legalization. And it will be tremendously consequential what choice is made. But, but I don't think FDA feels like it's its choice to make with respect to THC, and, and nor is it. It's something that ultimately Congress is going to have to speak on. Oh, certainly. Well, I promised we would get to, to questions sooner rather than later. Uh, does, okay, well, we got a few folks. Uh, just because you popped up in my line of sight first. Uh, <laughs> Just wondering what is the estimated impact of um, California legalization so far on the illegal market? Because my understanding is even though prices are coming down for production, which you talked about, that uh, the prices are still so much higher in the legal market that the Ill illegal market is still thriving, and especially kids um, are going to buy wherever it's cheapest. Yeah, I, I, so when we, I, I don't think anybody, I mean, there was estimates just alone in the Emerald Triangle, which was a Humboldt, Trinity, and Mendocino County. There was anywhere, we would get uh, estimates anywhere from 50 to 70,000 unlicensed cultivation sites. There was no strong baseline when we took, when the Bureau uh, started on how much, what, what the illegal, you know, how many businesses were operating illegal, but it was tremendous. And, and I don't think anybody thought in the first year of implementation that we are going to tackle the unlicensed market. It's, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take some, it's going to take years. But I, I think we need to, like, like I said, we need to do a better job of it. I, you're right. I think kids are always going to, you know, get wherever they can get cannabis cheaper. But I think the more we can really push people, get more cities and counties, one, to allow commercial cannabis activity, we still have a lot of banned areas. And a lot of times that's where the unlicensed market can thrive uh, because we're not, not so much in the regulated area. You still have a lot of it, but there's a lot more enforcement going on there uh, because it's easy for law enforcement. Once you're in a city, like for example, if you're in the city of San Francisco, it's a lot more easier for uh, San Francisco to determine who's licensed and who's not because they have to have a state license and a city license. So it's, you know who the players are. So I think, uh, again, this is a big priority for this new administration and for all of the licensing authority to really enforcement, enforcement, enforcement. So I think you're going to see some movement, uh, a lot more movement of eradicating and minimizing that illegal market this year. But it is going to take time. Uh, let's go over here first, the, the general gentleman there in the, in the back. So when the uh, proposition was on the ballot, there was a lot of uh, election hype about how much money was going to come to the state and local governments for the licensing of this product, and the state and local governments were going to actually get in the game. Is there anything going on measuring the economic impact net of all of the enforcement activity? Not to that level, no. And, and as, as you've seen, the, the last tax quarterly, tax quarterly tax revenues come in from California Department of Tax and Fee. Those revenues are way under projection. Uh, but a lot of that is a direct result of us not being able to issue more licenses because we are, we are, it, 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 we can only issue in areas that have local uh, ordinance and that approve of us to issue license. I think, again, as we issue more licenses, those revenues are going to go up. And you're right, we have to figure out what impact the money we're spending on enforcement has on the uh, on this how, how effective we're being part of the problem is there's so many agencies involved not just food and ag and public health you also have your county ag commissioners you have fish and wildlife uh, you have uh, the water boards everybody's doing some sort of enforcement related to their program and I think at some point you've got to figure out well how much money are we spending on that and how effective are we and we're getting to that point we're collaborating a lot more to to, to, to have those kinds of, of outcomes, to see what we're getting for the money spent. 
And then, uh, and I can speak to what we saw in Col Col Colorado when, when the state uh, legalized. It took a bit, like California and other states saw this too, for, for it to ramp up. And so the, and there were grand projections about what this revenue, uh, how much the state could bring in and where this would go. And, and, it, and Colorado was, felt it pretty significantly because a lot of the people expected, oh, this will save our budget issues in K through 12. This will help us hire teachers. This will, this will help, help us fill all these budgetary gaps. And what it did, I mean, this, this industry did pull, in terms of the sales, pull a lot of sales out of the illicit market. But in terms of how it's structured, it went to, it's, it's a drop in the bucket in terms of the overall state revenue picture. And it went to hiring, they always said hire, hire roofers, not teachers, because this went to capital programs for the schools. But uh, in terms of the revenue, it's going to so, so many different places in, in the state. And it's, and it's a lot, you know, when you hear, you know, a billion dollars of revenue or $200 million, uh, I think it's about $250 million a year. That's a significant amount of funds. But it is a drop, drop in the bucket, and I think it, it takes to, I th I'm hoping other states can learn from Colorado's lessons in terms of just helping public perception, helping people understand where this is actually going. Sorry, okay. Uh, gentleman there. I was curious how you are going to deal with like driving under the influence, testing for that, and maybe some of the other you know side effects of having legal marijuana. So there is no, unlike Colorado, there is no you know, uh, like I think there's five nanograms if you test. There's nothing like that in California. So you know, their testing is the same as when you pull over any other impaired driver for local law enforcement. So. Um, they, they have their certain tests for any kind of impairment. Now, the Bureau does have a, a research fund a grant that we have, um, are paying the University of California at San Diego. Uh, they've been working um, over the last two and a half years. Um, what they're studying is uh, the, uh, what the effects of consumption of cannabis are on motor skills. So they actually... Uh, have uh, subjects come in, smoke cannabis, and then they, tr they try them out on driving simulators, and then they're working with the California Highway Patrol to see if there's better methods to detect cannabis impairment because a lot of people feel it's a whole lot different than doing alcohol field sobriety tests. But to Jonathan's point, the problem is, is that the university uh, can only get uh, cannabis from certain, uh, they have to follow DEA rules. They're not getting the cannabis that people are consuming. Uh, they're usually lower THC, so they're not getting the same cannabis. So that's, that has to be fixed at some point. Um, but that research is going to be over at the end of this fiscal year, and they're going to be having a report, so it'll be interesting to see what's happening on that. And I think that's going to drive some of the policy on how we handle that. The biology and the chemistry is much more complicated because the amount of alcohol in your brain is matched by the amount of alcohol in your blood. So you measure blood, you measure what's in brain. That's not true for THC. It doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier readily, and it's fat-soluble. And also, the THC decomposes into its metabolites very quickly. So THC over time does this, impairment extends beyond, but then the metabolites, which are also tested for, extend even farther. I'd be happy to talk to you afterwards, but the, but the biology and the chemistry of it, it it's, 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 a, it's a more difficult thing than testing just blood alcohol. Wonderful. Oh, thank you. Um, from your research, Professor Jonathan, you mentioned that the usage of uh, cannabis has grown over tenfold. Daily and near daily use, yes. Yes, and uh, I noticed that it's usage among adults. So I'm wondering, what do we mean by adults? And uh, do, might we have data as to what category of adults we've seen uh, the increase in the usage of uh, cannabis? And for instance, 
this data, can it say something about uh, the population pyramid of the country? The, the population? Pyramid, or the population structure. Um, so uh, my definition of adult is 21 and over because most of the state laws uh, cut at that level. Canada is different. Canada has 18 as the age. The biggest increase in use in terms of age is actually, it's not youth. Uh, it, it, one of the striking changes is the extent to which cannabis continues on into middle age. It used to be something that you matured out of when you got a job and a mortgage. Um, and that's not so true anymore, which makes sense because its position in society has, has changed. Um, but the key point on who's using, it's 80% of it is by daily and near daily users, 50% is by people who spend 50% or more of their waking hours under the influence. It's very heavily concentrated in the smaller number of people who, who are using it not just every day, but, but a lot per day. And I think we have time for one more question. Gentleman over there. Mm -hmm. All right. um, can you tell me what this, and I use this loosely, experiment is costing the state in net dollars? You mean our experiment with regulations? We don't like to call it experiment. All right. but call it a, <laughs> that this enterprise is costing yes. the state. I know you're getting some revenue from we are. the legal industry, but w what are the taxpayers paying for this ramp up? Currently, so currently, uh, so we uh, we we're operating under a loan from the general fund that we're required to pay back uh, once we start uh, getting li like our licensing revenues have to sustain the bureau's operations. Same with public health and food at NAG. Um, so we are repaying that loan, but a lot of the the, the cannabis tax revenues are the main of what's paying off that loan right now. So. If you, so I guess if you're a cannabis user, you're, that's helping pay off the general fund loan. But uh, so we're we're set to have that probably paid off uh, by the end of next fiscal year. And the hope is is that our licensing fees to our cannabis uh, licensees will continue to sustain the bureau, similar to like ABC. And and our cannabis fees are quite extensive. They range from anywhere from five hundred dollars to well over. Uh, $200,000 per year, depending on your gross revenues. Yes, that is. Yeah, we can't make, we, as a state agency, we can only uh, charge what's going to cover our administration and operational costs. Wonderful. Okay, thank well, thank you very much to Alicia, Lori, and John.